Hello everyone, welcome back to Fanblade. Today we're going to take a deep dive into the world of POTS, potentiometers, variable resistors, um, you know, the part of your volume control that actually does the controlling of the volume. Um, all the hows, wheres, ohms, whys, and different wirings. Uh, I think the best place to start is actually to rip one open and see what's inside one of these things, because if you've never seen inside a POT, then prepare to be shocked and amazed at how boring and simple they really are. So, there's a small PCB with a strip of resistive material embedded in it. That little blackened circle there is usually made of graphite and, and or a graphite-based composite. It's basically a hard-wearing resistive material with a low coefficient of friction. Um, we've got three contacts on the outer of the PCB. The outermost two are connected to either side of the graphite, while the central one is connected to the wiper, which spins, making contact all along as it goes. The further the wiper is from a contact, the more resistance there is, and the lower the volume will be. That's it. It's a very, very simple concept, but it does give us a load of options as to how we use it. Now, the standard wiring for a volume knob in a guitar or bass is that the input from the pickup goes in on the left, the signal then travels around the resistive ring until it hits the wiper, then shoots up and out the center contract. That's not quite the end of the story, because the energy in the signal doesn't all just go straight up the wiper. The entire ring is energized to a certain extent, and that wiper is just tapping off from that point. So there's a lot of residual current that can float about and cause problems, buzzing, etc. So we connect the other side to ground, and all that excess just gets sucked away, never to be seen, or, more importantly, heard from again. The interesting thing here is that it doesn't actually matter which way around you connect the input and output. The resistance between the two points is going to be the same regardless. It's just better to go in the side and out the center so that the next person who comes along and has to fix a broken pot 10 minutes before showtime doesn't spend 9 of those minutes trying to work out what on earth you've done. I'll very rarely use this phrase in relation to anything musical, but in this instance, standardization is your friend. That said, let's do some non-standard things. You can connect the wires up not just reversed, but actually on the opposite sides. This means that the current is coming through the ring from the opposite side, the effect being that your volume knob is reversed. Uh, fully up becomes fully down, and vice versa. Uh, it happens on some left-handed guitars. There was one, uh, an Ibanez BTB series or something or other. I, I don't know if it was factory standard or if a previous owner reversed it, but I was asked to... Please install right-handed knobs, please, for the for the because the new owner was just it was driving her mad. She couldn't cope with it. Um, and I'd love to hear from anyone with a bit more insight into which manufacturers actually do this. Please leave a comment below. Um, I know you can buy actual left-handed knobs like uh, speed knobs with the numbers reversed, so it's it's obviously a thing. Uh, another non-standard thing is the blend knob. Now, sadly, I don't have one here to show you. And because of the way they're constructed, they're a bit harder to take apart without completely destroying them, so I'll try to draw you one. Essentially, they're a dual pot. That's two separate PCBs with half of the ring on each. There's a central detent, which could be a little spring or a little ball bearing or a few different little mechanisms. You'll feel the knob kind of go home, so to speak. And that detent is the point where both wipers are set to full volume. And as you turn the knob, one wiper will move onto a copper contact and stay the same volume, while the other moves onto a resistive surface and gets turned down. I've tried cheating this and blending from both sides of a single pot, and electrically it does actually function. But the point where both pickups are balanced... Uh, effectively in the middle, sees both of them coming through at half volume. And that's bad for tone, especially on a bass. Uh, which brings us nicely to talking about the effect of different pots on tone. Now, all the usual disclaimers here, tone is subjective, depends on your amp, strings, length of your fingernails, what colour the guitar is, all that jazz. But what we can do with electricity is measure it and come to some fairly reasonable conclusions about what's going on when we're talking about ohms. So, let's start talking about frequencies. This is a clean guitar note, recorded direct using my Epiphone Casino Coupe, uh, a low E.
Lots of frequencies in here. There's a few harmonics visible when we zoom in. Uh, we can see the fundamental note with the harmonics writing on it. Um, just by way of explanation, I'm going to EQ out all of the low end below 200 hertz. What we're looking for is a difference in volume or, or amplitude. And now you can easily see where the high amplitude of the bass frequencies has been removed. We're just left with the higher frequencies and they are dramatically quieter. If, if we play that back, yep, there's a 12 decibel difference in volume just by removing the bass frequencies. And it's a fairly well documented phenomenon this. In the real world of listening to noise as it's coming out of an amp at a typical gig, uh, a, a bass amp will be at least twice the wattage of an average guitar amp. Low frequencies need more power to create them. If you have a nice set of headphones, you'll no doubt be familiar with the scenario of hearing music coming from them while they're not on your head. Um, they sound thin and tinny. That's because they're not putting out enough bass power for the low frequencies to be audible any further than a centimetre or so from your ears. You know, they need to be close for that amount of power to actually reach your hearing. Flip that scenario around and it's the same reason for proximity effect in microphones. The voice is producing bass, but the mic can't pick it up until you get in really close and the sound becomes thicker and boomier. Lower frequencies need more power to be created and communicated. Once they have been released, they hold more sound pressure energy than higher frequencies. Bass frequencies are just more powerful. So, back to what's going on in our potentiometer. Essentially, we are cutting back on power, so we're losing low end. That's basically what's going on. It's not quite as simple as that, because if we record another guitar note with the volume set to half on the guitar, then we get proportional to the volume of the rest of the frequencies. If I make them all the same volume so we're able to compare easier, we've got louder high end and quieter low end with the guitar's pot on half. Therefore, more resistance equals less power equals less low end. Now, don't confuse this with the pot sounding brighter. It's not adding anything to the high end. I did that artificially just to show the difference, and most likely you'll compensate for that in the real world by adjusting your amp. You'll hear people saying the difference between a 250k pot and a 500k pot is that the 500 sounds brighter, which implies that it's adding highs. It's not. It's taking away lows and sounds thinner. There is much confusion about this. It's important to understand what's actually going on. I, I sometimes hear of people adding a one meg pot to a P bass, and they're amazed at the clarity. You know, they, they would be. If you've got a pickup that's a little bit muddy, then a higher value pot will clear that mud right out. Personally, I prefer a rounder sound. Uh, I've been known to go as low as 10k. Uh, it was a, a particularly thin single coil pickup, just a cheap Telecaster pickup that had been underwound, it was the twangiest of all thin sounding, sharp, nasty things, it was awful. Um, I popped in a 10k pot, and it gave it its body back. Um, there's, there's no hard and fast rules for which value pots should go with which style of pickups, it's up to you to use your ears, and what kind of sounds you are looking to get to know what to use. Always remember as well that it's only one piece of the puzzle when you're looking at pedals and amps and how far are you away from the amp you, you stand on stage, and what colour the drummer's hat is, and all the dozens of things that affect the tone. Which actually brings us to tone pots. Tone pots introduce a capacitor to the circuit, whereas resistors and resistance is bad for low end, capacitors are not good at transmitting high end. So, by using a 250k linear pot with a 47 nanofarad cap, you can cut out some high end. Different value caps give different results, but my experiments are fairly limited to what I know works, i.e. a 250k linear pot with a 47 nanofarad cap. That's it. That just seems to work best. Sometimes you'll get cheap guitars where all the pots are audio taper pots, including the tone control. And when you use a taper pot for the tone control, you get a very limited tone adjustment until the last eighth of a turn, when all of your high end suddenly goes away. Linear pots only on tone controls, please. Why audio taper pots for volume controls? Well, I don't really have a good answer for that, except to say that as a human, 
and I presume you're human as well if you're watching this. My apologies if in the future this video is seen by our Android overlords. But um, as a human, your hearing is not linear. Your ears pick up different frequencies at different volumes. And that's a sound engineering rabbit hole that we'll save for another video. Um, that about covers it. But there's just one thing I want to try. Now that I've got the lid off this pot, the little stop that prevents it from spinning all the way around is gone. So let's have a little fun. Well, there you go. The, the resulting recording looks a little bit like a sawtooth wave. I wonder if I can get 48 of these each spinning at a specific frequency, if I could make a fully mechanical 4-octave synthesizer. <laughs> mm, uh, yeah, again, I think I'll leave that particular snake pit of problems to another day. Uh, in the meantime, I hope you found this video entertaining. I had a lot of fun making it, so thank you very much for watching, thank you for subscribing, and I'll see you real soon. Cheers.